Okay, well, this is Dr. Morton uh, recording the video for uh, Wednesday, the 14th of October. Uh, I think it's, I don't know, I forget the number, maybe 20th or something. Anyway, uh, so here's the syllabus. So we're on week eight. This is Wednesday. And uh, we're going to do uh, unit 11 today. We're going to talk about flip-flops. Uh, and it turns out flip-flops are kind of a big deal. So this is really an important video. So um, pay attention. All right. Um, so homework seven is due next week. So be working on that. And uh, if I have a little time at the end, I'll talk about that. For sure, I'll, I'll maybe mention a little bit on Friday because I'm sure we'll finish this up on Friday. Okay, let's. Um, I'm going to shrink this down a little bit, and uh, and then we'll get to it here. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe something like that. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm going to. There we go. Okay. And. All right. So unit eleven. So. Uh, so let me just say a, a little word. Well, what, here's what we're going to cover. Well, here's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover um, flip-flops, the SR latch, the gate of D latch, uh, edge, trigger, ed, edge trigger, D flip-flops, and then SR flip-flop, JK flip-flop, T flip-flop, and D flip-flop. Well, which is that one anyway. Okay, so let me talk about the project presentation. So uh, I do want you to make up a PowerPoint uh, for your presentation. And I'd like you to, you, you can do a video and just, uh, and just email it to me. Uh, that's fine. It should be about uh, 8 to 12 minutes long. Uh, try and keep it no longer than that. Uh, if it's a little bit shorter, that's okay. But I do want you to have, uh, don't, do want you to have one slide that basically uh, talks, about, uh, talks about your problem. I uh, want you to show your truth table, explain how you approached it. Uh, I want you to go over the K-maps and how you solved them. Show how you shared terms between the K-map to meet your uh, the goal of your uh, number of gates you can have and, and, and inverters. Although usually the, the inverters and all the inputs are free. And then list any lessons learned. And then I want you to demonstrate the simulation uh, using uh, Logisim or uh, Multisim or any one of the in, any any of the online simulators. That's fine. The uh, if you want to do an optional hardware implementation, that's great. I will uh, set that up. Uh, I'll help you with hardware and stuff. But you do not have to have that done when you do your presentation. You can do that anytime before now in the final exam, and uh, I'll give you an extra one percent of course grade for that. Uh, but it's optional. Don't have to do it. It's totally optional. If if there's some member of your team that did not participate at all, let me know. That individual will get a zero. Uh, if everybody else uh, participated in uh, working the problem, then uh, then that's fine. I understand that there usually will be someone who kind of takes the lead and someone who does a little more work than some of the others, and that's okay. Uh, but as long as everybody participates and is available to, to, to work on the project, that's what really is important. Okay, um, and if you don't participate, then obviously you're not going to get any, any benefit from it either. Okay, so... Unit 11. So we've, uh, we're getting ready to now. This is the, the preparation for the transition from combinational design, which is the second part of the course, uh, to the third part of the course. Uh, the first part of the course was switching algebra codes, uh, kind of definition of digital and uh, number bases and binary numbers and stuff like that. The second part is combinational design, how you take a truth table and turn it into a circuit. And a number of different ways you can do that using uh, gates uh, in uh, SOP, POS, uh, NOR, NOR, NAN, NAN, uh, how you can uh, y implement it with a multiplexer, with, uh, with a ROM, uh, in a number of different ways, with a decoder. Uh, but now we're moving. Uh, we're now we're moving into our, our combination, our sequential design uh, part of the course, and uh, we're going to take a test on uh, units uh, five through eleven. And uh, unit eleven uh, is flip flops. Flip flops are what make state machines possible. 
because the flip-flops provide the memory for our state machines. And uh, a state machine, uh, all of our sequential designs, the big difference between uh, our sequential design circuits and our combinational design circuits that we've been doing is that our sequential design circuits will have memory, some memory in the circuit. Because we have to remember a little bit or a lot, depending on what the actual uh, problem is, about previous inputs. In combinational design, we don't care about previous inputs. We only care about current inputs minus a little propagation delay. Once the inputs are applied, there's a small delay. But after that, the outputs should be good, and they stay good until we change the inputs. In a, in a sequential design, we have the current inputs, but we also have uh, some history of previous inputs that is encoded in states. And so we have, so we're in some one of our, let's say we have n states, so we're in one of our n states, and we have new inputs, and that, and our current outputs then depend on not only the, uh, well, potentially just the state we're in, or the state we're in and the new inputs. Uh, and we have two different types of machines, we call one more and one melee, and the more only depends on what state we're in, the melee depends on what state we're in plus the plus new inputs. Uh, and we'll, we'll cover all that in due course. But what makes that possible, what, what holds the state we're in, is a flip-flop. So that's why we're introducing flip-flops now. Uh, so flip-flops are going to be also on uh, this, next, the, this uh, second midterm. Uh, but sequential designs will just be on the final. So, so we'll just cover flip-flops, and then uh, we're going to take a little break. We're going to get through all the, all the group projects, and then uh, we'll go on to sequential design after the second test. All right. Um, so, again, our combinational networks, outputs depend on the, uh, the present inputs only, but a sequential network, outputs also depend on the sequence of past inputs. And just exactly how it depends on that is totally variable. Uh, it depends on the problem. In some cases, we have to remember a lot of previous inputs, and we need a lot of states to do that. In other cases, we only have a few uh, states that we need, maybe two. Usually, you, you need more than one state to call it a sequential design, because if you only have one state, then uh, you really have a combinational design. Okay, so sequential networks require memory. And our memory is generally provided by flip-flops. Uh, interestingly, read-only memories don't provide the memory for a sequential network, and that's because read-only memories, uh, we normally don't change them in the midst of uh, 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 using them. We, we f populate them with the information they we want them to retain, and then we use them for maybe a long time, maybe forever, until we throw them away. Uh, Flip-flops, on the other hand, uh, are changing states dynamically all the time. Uh, every clock cycle, our flip-flops may change. And so our flip-flops are generally what's used to hold uh, our actual uh, state, uh, the number of our state, or the, our, it gives us what state we're in. Uh, we, I guess we could use uh, static RAM, uh, but we normally don't do that either because we usually use static RAM for more uh, complicated purposes. Um, all right, so anyway, uh, all of our flip-flops and latches, and, and, and traditionally, all of our memory elements are, are just like the rest of the digital world. They can assume one of two stable states, true or false, one or zero, whatever you want to call it. And the states can be changed by inputs. Uh, if you don't change the inputs, then the states should stay the same of these memory devices. And uh, so how, how do we make these, um, these memory devices? How do we make flip-flops? Well, uh, a flip-flop is a latch that changes states only on a clock input. Now, the way these work, all the latches and all flip-flops involve feedback to basically make them work. Uh, in some manner, the outputs are sent back to the inputs in some way. And that feedback is basically what gives the latch its, its stability and hence its memory. All right, here is the basic building block of all flip-flops. Now, the, the building block for, um, for
for for uh, uh, static uh, random access memory uh, is is a little different. And we're not gonna. It's really kind of beyond the scope of this course. Uh, but but flip flops. This is this is the building block for all flip flops. So how does this work? Well, first we have uh, two NOR gates. And if you look at this, you realize that it's kind of interesting because we we see we have this uh, we have this interesting arrangement where we have this feedback. The output of this NOR gate is going into the input of this NOR gate, and the output of this NOR gate is going into the input of this NOR gate. Along with these, we also have an S and an R input that are going in as well. Um, so this, the S input is a set input, the R input is a reset input. So this is set, reset. And uh, so because of that, uh, we can put this in one state or put this in another state. And, uh, and, and here is basically the truth table uh, or uh, how this uh, flip-flop behaves. If the, if the S and the R are both zero, then it's gonna it's gonna stay in whatever state it's in. Now now what does that mean? Why is that? Well, let's look at this. Let's uh I'm gonna put some numbers on here. Uh, I'm gonna do this pointer thing. Okay. Now let's say for sake of argument that uh, we're gonna make the input S a zero, and we're gonna make the input R a zero. Now that's that was bad. I'm gonna erase this. Okay, and then let's do again. Okay, so I'm going to make the R a zero. All right, now, so both S and R are zero. Now we're going to power this thing up. All right, so when you put, uh, when you have a zero in, and we don't know what this input is, but let's say, maybe, let's just argue and say it's a zero. So out of this, we get a zero before the bubble, but after the bubble, we get a one. Okay. Now this one then goes in over here, and we have a zero and a one going in. So before the bubble we have a one, but after the bubble we have a zero. So this zero goes in here. Now we do have two zeros going in here. Before the bubble we have a zero. That wasn't a very good zero. There we go. And after the bubble we have a one, and that one goes in here. So. If you notice this, this is a pretty stable situation, right? Uh, the output of this top flip-flop uh, is is driving, the output of this top flip-flop is definitely driving this, uh, sorry, of this uh, NOR gate, is driving this NOR gate to output a zero, which is keeping this NOR gate outputting a one, which is keeping this nor gate of outputting a zero. Now this is all well and good, but what happens now if we change? And so, so basically, we have uh, Q is zero and Q prime is one. Okay. Now remember, the the rule should be that that Q and Q prime are always the inverse of each other. So in this case, then uh, Q equals uh, Q equals zero. Oh, I, did, I guess I messed that up somehow. Let me fix that. So Q equals zero, and Q prime equals one. Now lo let's look, what happens if we change S from a zero to a one? Well now, this, this, nor, this nor gate before the bubble is now one, and after the bubble, it's now a zero. So th this zero now goes in here. Now we have two zeros going in, so now we have a zero before the bubble, and after the bubble, we don't have a zero anymore, we have a one. And now we don't have this zero anymore, we have a one. So now we're, we're basically keeping this output a one, which is keeping this NOR gate at a zero after the bubble, and that's keeping this NOR gate at 
to be a zero before the bubble and a one after the bubble. And so now, now what happens if we take this S input and move it back to zero? What's going to happen? Well, we still have a one going in here, a zero for S, so we'll still have a one before the bubble and a zero after. And that'll keep this, this NOR gate with two zeros will be a zero before the bubble and a one after. And this one is going to be fed back to this one and keep this one outputting a zero. So it's so now we're in a different stable state. And now, now we have instead of instead of uh, q equal zero, it equals one, and instead of q prime equals zero, now uh, equals one rather, now it equals zero. So what you see is there are two stable states. Now, what if we raise uh, R to a 1? If we raise R to a 1, we'll put it back in its original state, where Q prime is a 1 and Q is a 0. So there's two stable states. Q is 1 or Q is 0. Now, the only tricky thing about this is, what if we make S and R both 1s? Well, then we have a little problem. Let's look at that briefly. Let's say we make them both ones. Did I did something wrong? So S is one, R is one. In that case, before the bubble they're going to be one. After the bubble they're going to be zero. One, and then uh, that means that the inputs over here are going to be zeros, and this is going to be a zero. Now, so. After the bubble, this is going to be a one, a zero over here as well. So notice both Q prime and Q are zero. But remember, Q prime and Q are supposed to be the inverse of each other, so that's a problem. So we're sort of violating the rule of Q and Q prime here. And uh, and then what if we take S and R back to zero simultaneously? We we take this back to zero. We make this back go back to zero. What's going to happen? It actually, we actually don't know, but we know that it's going to resolve one way or the other. It's going to resolve uh, so that it's in one of the two stable states. So either Q will be a one and it'll stable be stable at that, or Q will be a zero and it'll be stable at that. So that's why we have sort of this this rule that S and R should never be be one at the same time. We, we, we say this creates an unstable state. It, it doesn't really. It just it makes Q prime and Q both zero, which is kind of illegal. And when we if we take S and R away at the same time, we don't know what state it's going to wind up in. But other than that, it, it's not going to explode or anything, or it's not going to burn up any chips. But it is going to create a situation where we don't really, you know, where we, where we, where we have sort of a, a logical contradiction. And that is that we have... Uh, Q and Q prime being the same thing when they're supposed to be the inverse of each other. All right, so that's 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 the SR latch. So what we say then is we have a rule that S and R should never be uh, one at the same time. In other words, S S ended with R has to equal zero. All right, uh, let me erase this. All right. Now I have a little, uh, here's a little thing. This this shows you, see how it's changing back and forth? So there's two Qs. So we raise S to 1, and it switches to this. We raise R to 1, and it switches to this. All right. Now, here here is, uh, here is, this is called the SR latch, and these are still used. In fact, most microprocessors have them because an SR latch is the f is the is the fastest latching circuit we can make. Basically, uh, it's it's a it 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 is it responds in just uh, three or four nanoseconds typically. So it is a very quick circuit, and and this is very helpful for latching in uh, signals. Um, but we, it does have this problem that we can never let S and R be one at the same time. So that is, a, that is a little bit of a problem for us. And we also have this, uh, we also have this, uh, 
uh, symbol. It, usually we set it up as a square. We have S and R going in one side and Q and Q prime coming out the other side. See, I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna switch the pointers. Okay. Oh. All right. So anyway, so here we have, um, here we have our symbol. R and S are our inputs. Q prime and Q are the outputs. Now notice when we write the symbol, we usually write Q prime opposite R and Q opposite S. But in the actual circuit, Q prime is on the NOR gate that S goes into, and and Q is on the, is the output of the NOR gate that R goes into. But we don't really care about the details uh, of of the wiring when we write the schematic. So we usually write it like this. Uh, we usually write RS like this because we, we uh, and then Q Q prime and Q or you could write S and R but normally we put Q opposite S because S is the set input even though strictly speaking it's 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 it comes out of the opposite or nor gate all right well anyway and now we have an, a, a, a different table over here and I want you to kind of pay attention to this notice that uh, in this table we have this new symbol called Q plus. Now Q plus is uh, is uh, is is what's called uh, the next state. So we have the present current value of Q and then we have what happens to Q given new inputs. So if, if we have S is R zero, R is zero, and Q is zero, then Q isn't going to change. But if uh, and if Q is 1, then it's not going to change. It'll stay 1. But if we have S is 0, R is 0, and Q is currently uh, uh, 1, then it is going to switch to 0. And if we have S is 1, and Q is currently 0, it's going to switch to 1. Now, what we don't allow, again, is S and R to both be 1. So we have those as kind of, sort of as don't cares, because we, we're promising we're never going to let that happen. Uh, <clears throat> now, so this is the SR latch. Now there are some there are some problems with the SR latch. One problem is that we have to prevent S and R from being one at the same time. And how do we do that? That could be tricky. Another thing is um, we don't we don't really uh, we don't have a clock to keep things all synchronized. And so we kind of like to have a circuit that has a clock. And we'd like it to be an edge triggered clock too, not just a level clock. So. So we'll make some of these changes. So, so one of the things we do sometimes is we have what's called a gated SR latch. Uh, and so we, here, here is one way to do that, to put it, this AND gate in front and gate the R and the S into these NOR gates. So that's one way to do it. Um, <clears throat> but this doesn't really uh, solve the problem of R and S being one. But here... Um, we do have a uh, we do have now this gated D latch, which which uses an RS latch in, internally, but it has uh, it has two two input AND gates and an inverter. Now look what happens here. Instead of having R and S inputs, we just have a D input, and we invert the R input with an inverter, and we don't invert the S input, and then we also add a, a gate in to these two AND gates. So now, when, when the gate is, uh, is, is open, allowing, uh, which means it's, it's one, we, so the gate's active, that means that D is passed through. Uh, we pass D to S and D prime to R. And so this latch then is gonna follow D. If D is one, the latch is Q is going to go to one. If the D is zero, the Q is going to go to zero. Now, when G becomes uh, becomes inactive, we say it's no longer asserted, so it's deasserted, and uh, and that means these two AND gates are are also basically put put into a putting out a zero. When R and S are both zero, what happens? This latch holds its value. So basically, now we have a situation where uh, S and R can no longer be one at the same time. 
it, we prevent that by inverting one of these D inputs. And so, so this is a very, this is a very, um, uh, th this is a very common device, this gated D latch. Now we still have the problem that, that there's no clock. Okay, we still have to fix the clock problem. Now, um, and here's what the timing diagram is. Here's where the gate is closed, and D changes, but Q doesn't. Here's where the gate is open, uh, and we see that uh, we see that D now passes through to Q with a little teeny delay. And then once the gate closes again, then we lock in whatever value D is, regardless of what whether D changes and goes back to zero or not. So we put the latch into a, a, a mode of holding its, its previous inputs. All right. <coughs> now, here is, a, here is our first clock flip-flop. Now, this doesn't really explain how the clock works, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of not talk about this. I'm just going to kind of skip, because in the end, what we really want to do get to is is a is a master slave jk flip-flop and and so we're kind of incrementing our way there but rather than spend time talking about these i'm going to talk about the master slave jk flip-flop because this is really the key okay so so this is really the key so i'm going to try and explain it this in some detail and then we'll probably quit all right so let me uh let me get the pointer back. I know this is it's just not really perfect, but what can I do? All right, so anyway. So, so if you look at this, what you see is you see a master stage and a slave stage. And uh, you see on this left side, we have, a, we have a K and we have a J input. So we don't use the names R and S anymore. We use J, K. Now, why, I don't really know. But notice one other thing. We have, we have a, uh, an RS latch in here. We'll call, this, we'll call this one A. And we have one over here. Man. And we'll call this one B. So we have A and B latches. Now, or you can call it the master and slave. That, maybe that's better. All right. Now, what happens is that, uh, that we have a clock input right here. Now, the clock input has a little inverter in it right here. So what that means is then that at any given time the this the set of this these these AND gates here will be uh, will be enabled because the clock will be one or if clock here if this input clock is zero then over here then these two AND gates will be active and these two will not be active they will be inactive. So what this does then, this, this allows us to set up our inputs in the master stage and then when the clock switches from high to low or low to high, depending in this case from uh, high to low, then it propagates what we've set up in the master stage onto the slave stage, but at the same very, at the very same time it forces the master, it forces the A RS latch into a hold mode so that now you can't during the next that half of the clock cycle you can't change the output so you you protect the output from changing and it can and really the output can only change on that on that falling clock edge from high to low now you could obviously uh, uh, change this inverter around and put the inverter up here and have the clock go in directly so that when the clock is one, uh, when it transitions from zero to one, that it actually latch, that it actually propagates to the slave stage. So you could have a rising edge clock or you can have a falling edge clock. Uh, you can set that up 
uh, either way. And flip-flops indeed come in both rising edge and falling edge type JK flip-flops. So that's 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 the main idea. Now, partly how this how this works is we always we also have feedback coming from the output stage. So notice notice the path right here coming all the way back into here and notice the path uh, right here coming all the way back into here. And so what this does, this this keeps that this means that J and K uh, can never uh, that 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 on this flip flop R and S would never be one at the same time. That's what that means. So one of these AND gates is always shut down, and one is always turned on, because when you're when you're able to when these AND gates are enabled because of the clock, then then these AND gates right here in the uh, slave stage are are disabled. So these, so the feedback from the from the slave stage outputs uh, really prevents us from uh, ever having J and K one at the same time on this first master uh, flip flop, and obviously that means then that that from um, the the A R S slash the master stage the output, and you can see they're labeled P and uh, P bar or P prime and P. They are always the opposite of each other. Just like Q and Q prime are always going to be on the on the slave stage, those outputs are always going to be the opposite of each other. So this 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 is a very well behaved flip flop. Uh, we can never have R and S in our internal stages, uh, either the A latch or the B latch. R and S can never be one at the same time. We're preventing that, and we're also preventing changes on the input from uh, from being applied and propagating through without uh, without having to wait uh, for the clock change the, the those cha those those uh, changes on the input only propagate in this example on the uh, falling edge of the clock when the clock goes from zero to from one to zero the the transition from the slave master stage to the slave stage occurs and then when the clock switches the other way the slave stage goes into a hold mode and and nothing can change it until it falls again so only on the falling edge does anything change so we now have an edge triggered jk flip-flop which is really what we want now why why do you think we want to have a flip-flop that changes on the edge well the answer is if you look at this timing diagram down here the time that the clock is high, so here's the clock right here. Here's our clock. And notice it's low here, and then it's high here. Well, notice it's high for a long time. But the only, t the only time that things can actually change on the Q outputs is right after, there's the falling edge. There's a little propagation delay right here, and that's it. Here's another, here's another falling edge. And there's a little propagation delay, but that but then that output then is stable until the next falling edge. Here's the next falling edge. And you can see changes only occur on the falling edge. Now there's there's several different ways this flip-flop works. What happens if uh, if J is one and K is zero? Well, if J is one, and let's say we're the clock is currently high. All right, I'm going to erase all the ink on the slide, and we'll we'll do it one more time. Okay, so now let's say let's say J is one, and K is zero, and let's say that the clock is one. So we'll put a one there and a one there. Now, if the clock is one, that puts that means that uh, that means that here the clock is zero. So there's a zero there and a zero there. It's hard to make zeros. So, uh, okay. So that's so that means that that the output then from this flip flop is zero, from this AND gate. I'm sorry, and the output from this AND gate is zero, regardless of what P and P prime are. Okay, doesn't matter. We know if if one of these inputs is zero, then the output is zero, guaranteed. So therefore, this slave stage is holding, 
and let's say that it's currently q is 0. So here's a 0, and q prime then is 1. So that means we have a 1 going in on the k input, and we have a, uh, oh, sorry, I, I said that wrong. We have a 0 going in here, which means we have a 0 out here, but we have a 1 going in here. So now we, J is a 1, clock is a 1, the feedback from Q bar is a 1, so this S input happens to be a 1. So now what's going to happen to this latch? Well, this latch is then going to, is then going to have Q being a 1, so this is going to be a 1 here, and Q bar is going to be a 0. All right, now that's all set up. Now does this change the, the, the slave stage? No, it does not change the slave stage because uh, the clock inputs to these AND gates right here is zero. So these AND gates are outputting zero. So this, this slave latch is, is in a hold mode. And in, even with this zero and one going in, it's not going to affect it. But when the clock falls from zero, from one to zero, then look what happens. Well, when that happens, then then the clock input now, uh, the clock input now becomes zero on both clocks, and that means that now both R and S are zeros, and that then that means that this is going to hold. So P is one, P bar is zero. That's going to stay that way until the clock changes again. But now the clock here, these become ones. So these AND gates open up and turn on. And now we propagate the P equals 1 to the S and the P equals 0 to the R. And this latch then goes into a set mode with Q now. We get rid of this 0 here and now it equals 1. And this then becomes a 0. And then of course that feeds back on here. Now this is a 1 and this is a 0. And so, so now, this this means that this uh, master stage uh, k is a zero, and we have a zero on on this lower flip flop. Even if j is stays one, this latch is going to go into hold mode, and it's going to preserve its state. Okay. So what we're what we're left with then? Let me. I'm going to switch here. I'm going to bring this up, and I just want to draw a little bit for a second. Let me. Oh, okay. Now, what I want you to see, so, so here is our, so here we have our, we have our RS here, and our RS here, and we've got our AND gates here, we've got our clock input, and then we have the outputs from here. We have our inverter, and then we have another AND gate. We have our output from here that goes up here to this AND gate. We have our output from here that goes to that one. And then we have uh, JK. And then we have our clock input that goes here and here. Now, and then these are the outputs. Uh, Q and Q prime. Now, uh, and then this is also Q and Q prime. I think we actually call them P. But all right. So now, uh, now what happens though? Uh, so we have several possibilities. We have we have both J and K zero. And this 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 this, this this master slave JK flip flop is going to hold. So so if J and K both are zero, it's going to hold. Now if J is one and K is zero, then the flip flop is going to set. Now it may already be set, but if it isn't, it will set. If J is zero and K is one, it's going to clear. 
So set means Q equals zero, or we'll say Q plus. Hold means Q plus equals the present Q. Clear means that Q plus, sorry, set means Q plus equals one. Clear means Q plus equals zero. And then what happens if they're both one? Now this is really interesting. If they're both one, what's going to happen then is we have we have a one going in here. Let's say it's in let's say q equals zero, so q prime equals one. So then we have a zero going in for k and a one going in here for j. And then let's say our clock is a one. So this flip this AND gate puts out a zero, but this one puts out a one. So we have s equals one, r equals one. So this is going to set. Then when the clock switches from a 1 to a 0, it's going to propagate q equals 1, q prime equals 0 onto this one, which is going then to make q equal to 1. Now notice, because this feeds back, this now becomes a 0, or whatever. This now becomes a 1. This now becomes a 0. And, uh, and as a result, then uh, it it blocks this one going in and it puts a one here on the G, on the K. So now, now uh, when the clock is in the other half, then it's gonna it's gonna make this flip flop switch, and this will be Q is zero and Q prime is one. And then when the clock falls, it's gonna propagate this through and will switch. So what you're gonna see happen is every active every time the clock falls from zero to one, it's gonna toggle the output. Now what does that mean? It means that the output, if it is 1, is going to go to 0, or if it is 0, it's going to go to 1. So, so we say this toggle. Toggle means just flipping the state. And, and so here are the four different modes that the, uh, the, the master-slave JK flip-flop edge triggered works on. It works on, it's either holding, toggling, it's setting or clearing, depending on J and K. And it turns out that for uh, that we can make two different kinds of flip-flops out of this JK. We can make a D flip-flop, or we, or we can take the two toggle and hold, and we can make a T flip-flop. Sorry, you can realize you can't see that. So here's here so here's the we'll say this is q plus. So j, j and k if they're both zero, the output's going to stay the same. If j is one and k is zero, the flip flop's going to set, which means q plus will be one. If the j is zero and k is one, the output's going to be zero when it's when the clock hits. And then if they're both one, the clock's going to toggle. It's going to switch states. These middle two are how a D flip-flop functions, and the top and the bottom are how a T flip-flop functions. And the way we make a D flip-flop is we, we have a D input here, and we take the D input and we connect it directly into the J, but we put it through an inverter and go into the K input. And the way we make a T is we, we just take out this inverter and we tie the two inputs together. And if T is one, it's gonna to toggle, and if T is zero, it's gonna it's gonna hold. So that's what we mean by a T. A T flip-flop is a toggle flip-flop. Now there's really no such thing as T flip-flops. We have lots of D flip-flops, but there's really no such thing as a T flip-flop. But we can make one out of a JK. All right, I'm gonna switch the camera back. Okay, so so this is so this is basically what I want you to learn. This is really basically the main take-home message from from this uh, from this chapter. The take-home message is our master-slave JK flip-flop is the basic building block, along with the RS latch. We still do use RS latches all by themselves because they're fast. The JK slave flip-flop has two stages, and so it, it takes a full clock cycle, 
whereas a, a, the RS latch can work on just a half a clock cycle, if you will. Uh, so it's a little faster. Uh, this this master slave JK flip flop is kind of the building block. If we have a D input and we in, we invert one side of it into D and put the other directly into J, we make a D flip flop. A ma we we make a edge triggered master essentially an edge triggered D flip flop. If we connect J and K together, that's our T input. Then we have a T flip flop. And if we leave it with just J and K by the, by themselves, we have a JK flip flop. Now there's there's pros and cons, but because a JK flip flop has two inputs, uh, it does increase the amount of wiring that it takes to hook it up. You have to hook a wire to J and a wire to K. Whereas if you just have a D, you only have to hook up one wire, uh, which is your input to the flip flop. The same with T, but the T is a little more complicated because uh, because in the D whatever d is that's what the flip flops going to be after the next clock, active clock edge whereas with the with the G, with the t flip flop we have to decide whether to make t a 0 or a 1 uh, based on whether we want it to hold or toggle <coughs> okay so that's that's the primary information i want you to take away from this uh, and i think i'll stop with this and we'll finish this up on uh friday and we'll also, I might uh, have time to work a homework problem or so.